Established over 10 years, Time Computers is the UK's leading direct supplier of PCs to home users and small businesses. Systems are assembled in Britain using the latest components and technology to give you complete confidence and peace of mind. Hello, welcome and thank you for buying your new PC from Time Computers. Time's aim is for you to get the best possible benefit and enjoyment from owning a PC. So in this video, we'll show you everything you need to know about your new computer. The program lasts about an hour, but it's divided up into sections. Now, if you're a beginner, we suggest you watch the whole video before you start using your PC. If you're a more experienced user, you may not need to watch all the sections but you may find that some of them are useful to familiarize yourself with features you might not have seen before. Now, with the help of the menus, you should be quickly able to find the sections you want. We'll show you what to do when your PC arrives and how to connect all the pieces of hardware together. Then, we'll take you through the procedures for when you use your PC for the very first time. We'll show you how to install software, how to get on the internet and connect printers and other add-on pieces of equipment. And finally, we'll show you how to contact the customer care centre if you have any real problems. The chances are that you're watching this programme before your PC has arrived. So, in this section, we'll show you what to do when it's delivered. Now, when you ordered your computer, you are quoted a delivery date. This is normally 10 to 14 working days after your payments cleared. In that time, your PC will be built and will have its software preloaded and be thoroughly tested for many hours. Your computer will be delivered by reputable courier. If you're out when the courier calls, they'll leave a note so that you can phone to arrange a suitable time for them to return. Now, the whole system will come in a number of boxes, depending on what you've ordered. When it arrives, check the number of boxes against the courier's consignment note. Make sure, too, that there's no external damage to any of the boxes. If you have any problems, contact the customer care centre. We'll show you how to do that later on. Take the boxes into the room where you'll be using your PC. As you unpack the boxes, check that you have all the bits and pieces. This will depend on the system you ordered, but in general, in the main systems box, you should have the system unit, the keyboard, a mains lead, and the mouse. There'll also be the information file, a binder containing documentation and software which relates to your system. The monitor box will contain the monitor, its stand, and power cable, unless this is also in the main system box, and a user manual. Any additional hardware and software, such as speakers, a joystick and CDs, will be in the accessories box. The invoice will normally be in this box as well. Also included is your Windows 98 CD. Your PC comes with Windows pre-loaded and ready to use, so this CD is just for backup purposes. But keep it handy because you will need the product key number on the front of the manual when you switch your PC on for the first time. If some things appear to be missing, look through all the boxes and check the invoice. Some items may be marked to follow. This means that they were out of stock when your PC was shipped and will be sent on shortly. You will, however, have all the necessary equipment to get you started. If the missing items aren't marked to follow, then contact the customer care centre, and we'll show you how to do that later in the programme. After you've unpacked all the hardware, do keep the boxes and packing materials safe. You can then use them again if you need to move the PC or return it for an upgrade or repair. Now that you know you've got all the right bits and pieces, you can start connecting them together. But before you do that, it's worth thinking about the best place to put your PC. So, here are a few do's and don'ts. The PC should stand on a hard, flat surface with plenty of room around it for all the cables and accessories. 
Obviously, you need to make sure there are enough power points handy and a telephone socket so you can use the modem. And finally, don't place the PC in direct sunlight or near a radiator or other heat source. OK, so when you've chosen a good spot, you can start putting your PC together. You can have the system unit under the desk, but most people prefer to place it next to the monitor. The monitor should be attached to its stand, by the way. All the pieces of hardware, your keyboard, mouse, joystick, and so on, plug into the back of the system unit. Most of the cables will be connected into this connector panel. With your PC, you'll receive this Getting Started leaflet that shows you how everything fits together. OK, back to the PC. On most systems, the connectors are color-coded to help you match up the connectors and sockets. First, connect the monitor. Plug the power lead into the back of the monitor and then into the socket on the back of the system unit. Then connect the signal lead. The monitor connector has screws on each side to hold it securely in place. Next, connect the keyboard. Make sure the marker on the plug lines up with the notch on the socket. Then connect the mouse to the mouse port in the same way. Now connect the speakers to the speaker socket. The speakers also have their own power supply. Don't worry if your system also includes a printer, scanner, joystick, a video camera or a digital camera. We'll get the PC up and running first and show you how to connect the other peripherals later in the video. Well now you can connect the mains lead to the PC. Plug it into the wall socket and switch on. Do check that all the connections are secure. You must never connect or disconnect any part of the system while it's switched on because that could damage it. So, now it's all together, it's worth thinking about your position as you use your PC. Uh, they are addictive. You could find yourself spending many hours in front of the screen, so it is important that you're comfortable. Ideally, you should sit on a chair like this with height adjustment. When you're using the keyboard, your forearms should be horizontal and your elbows level with the desktop. The monitor should be at arm's length from you and your eyes should be more or less level with the top of the monitor screen. Position the monitor so that you avoid reflections from windows or lighting. And finally, place the keyboard a few inches from the edge of the desk so that you can rest your hands when you're not using it. Now, before you actually switch on, let's take a closer look at some of the hardware in your PC. All PCs have the same buttons, though the exact layout may vary from model to model. This button is the main on-off switch that you'll use day by day. When you do switch on, this green light will come on to show that the PC is powered up. This is the reset switch and is used to restart the computer without switching off the power. This symbol, which looks a bit like a drum, represents the hard disk drive which is inside the system unit. And the red light next to it will come on whenever the hard disk is active. Programs and work are kept in things called files and these are normally stored on the hard disk. Reading or writing large amounts of information can sometimes take a few seconds. This light lets you know that the hard drive is working away. By the way, the computer uses the letter C to refer to the hard drive, so it's often called the C drive. We've just been talking about the hard disk drive. On the front of the system unit, you'll see this floppy disk drive. Floppy disks are enclosed in these neat plastic covers, and they're used to store work files and for making backup copies of data. It's very important to put the disk into the drive the correct way round. On one edge of the disk is a shutter, and this edge goes into the drive first. Put it in with the label on the disk facing upwards. You can see a small arrow on the left of the disk, which will help you insert it correctly. Push the disk into the drive until it clicks into position. To remove it, press the button and pull it out. All floppy disks have what's called a write protection tab. When the tab is down and there's no hole, you can save data on the disk. If you want to avoid the risk of the data being accidentally erased, slide the tab so that the hole is open. The floppy disk drive is referred to as the A drive by the computer. 
the third type of drive in your PC is the CD-ROM drive, and this is usually referred to by the letter D. Well, this reads the CDs that most software is now sold on, and it can play standard music CDs too. When you buy software, there's usually an install process where some or all of the programs on the CD are copied across to the computer's hard disk drive. Loading CDs is very easy. There may be one or two buttons on the front panel, and the one with an arrow pointing upwards will open the tray. Simply place the CD in the round section in the tray with the writing facing upwards, and then push the button again to close it. It's very important not to pull or push the tray on its way in or out. Some CDs will begin installing a program or playing music as soon as the tray is closed. This is called autoplay. Many time systems may come fitted with the latest DVD, or Digital Versatile Disk Drives. Now these look and work in a very similar way to CD drives. In fact, they can also read CD-ROM discs, but they hold much more information. Now this means that DVD-ROM discs can contain full-length movies, and even more exciting games and comprehensive multimedia programs. DVD systems are regionalized and some DVD-ROM discs, usually those containing movies, may be coded to work only on PC systems in a certain region, such as Europe, which is Region 2, whilst others will work with systems in any region. When you're buying DVD discs, always check that they are compatible with your system. Your system may also include a CD writer, known as Drive E, so that you can create your own music and data CDs using special recordable discs. The keyboard is an essential part of the PC system. Part of it looks like a typewriter keyboard, but there are lots of other important keys as well. So, let's take a look at some of them. This key is particularly important. It's the return or enter key. This key starts a new line when you're typing text, but it's also used to send information to the computer. Along the top of the keyboard are a series of function keys labeled F1 to F12. These are a quick way of giving certain commands to the computer, such as printing a document or saving a file. On the right of the keyboard, you'll see a numeric keypad. This offers a handy way of entering lots of figures. This section contains keys for moving around the screen. For example, if you're working on a document in a word processor program, the point at which any new typing will appear is marked by this flashing line called the cursor. If you want to type somewhere else in the document, you must move the cursor to that point before you begin adding the new text. You can move the cursor with these arrow keys. In fact, the arrow keys are used to move around many types of program, as you'll see. These keys above, marked Home, End, and so on, move the cursor around the page in bigger jumps compared to the single steps that the arrow keys make. Along the bottom of the alphabet part of the keyboard, there are some additional keys that may be new to you. This key, which stands for Control, and this one, which stands for Alternate, are used with the alphabet keys to give instructions to software programs. For example, pressing Control and S together saves a file. There are also these keys which have special functions in certain pieces of software. Well, that's the keyboard. Now let's take a look at the mouse. Now, using the mouse is another way of giving instructions to the computer. By moving the mouse, you move this arrow around the screen. When it's over the button for the command that you want, you click the left button to carry out that command. Let's see how it works. You hold the mouse like this, and by sliding it around the mouse mat, you move the arrow on the screen. The screen contains various symbols. These are called icons, and they represent different commands. Now, say you've typed this letter in the word processor program, and you want to print it out. This icon here means print out the document. So, you move the mouse arrow over that icon, and click the left mouse button to tell the PC that you want to select that command. The mouse is also used to select menus from the menu bar at the top of the screen. In most Windows programs, you'll see a row of words near the top of the screen. 
If you click on any of these, a list or menu drops down with a list of commands. Move the arrow over the one you want and click again to select it. Let's say you want to check the spelling in this document. Click on the word Edit. A menu drops down and one of the options is Check Spelling. Click on that and the program will show you any spelling mistakes that you've made. Most mice have two buttons and you normally click the left one to send instructions in this way. The right button is used to bring up special menus in most programs. Now a couple of other points about using the mouse. To select some items such as launching a new program you have to double click the left mouse button quite quickly. Now that can take a little bit of practice. And another mouse skill that's important is called clicking and dragging. If you select certain items and then continue to hold down the left mouse button while you move the mouse, you literally drag that item around the screen. This idea is used in all sorts of ways, such as drawing a line in a design program or moving work files between folders. Some systems may have been supplied with the IntelliMouse or Wheel Mouse. This looks very similar to the ordinary mouse, but it has a wheel between the two buttons which can be turned to allow you to scroll through, for example, a word processor document. The wheel also acts as a third button, and its function may be different depending on the software being used. So, think about the best location for your PC. Connect together the various components using the Getting Started leaflet to help you, and make sure the connections are secure. Familiarize yourself with the various parts of the PC. You've normally got three drives on your machine. The hard disk or C drive. The A drive, which is for floppy disks, and a D drive, which is either a CD-ROM drive or a DVD-ROM drive. If you have a CD writer too, this will be drive E. Now you're ready to switch on your PC. But before you do, it's wise to switch on any other peripherals, that is extra add-on equipment such as speakers first. Oh, and don't forget to switch the monitor on. Well now, we'll switch on the PC. The computer will immediately spring into life, and you'll see a variety of text messages move up the screen very quickly, and the Windows logo may appear a couple of times. Don't worry, because that's all quite normal. The PC is booting up, as it's called. It will do this every time you switch on. After a few seconds, everything will settle down. Then you'll see this box, which is called a dialog box. It means that the computer is asking you for some information. First, it wants you to enter your name in the boxes. You then click on Next. The next screen asks if you'd like to have a tutorial to show you how to use the mouse. Press M if you want to have that lesson, but if you're happy about using the mouse, press the Escape key in the top left of the keyboard. The next section uses the modem in your PC to electronically register your copy of Windows with Microsoft. Your new PC is already registered with time, so this step isn't necessary. So just click on the Skip button. The next screen wants you to confirm that you really do want to skip the registration. Click on Yes and then Next to move on. Windows now displays the terms and conditions under which you're allowed to use it. When you're ready, click on I accept, and then Next. Now you're asked for your product key. This is a unique series of numbers and letters that's used to register your copy of Windows. The key can be found on the Windows CD package that was supplied with the system. Take care to type it in exactly as it appears. That's all the information that Windows needs. Click Finish and restart the computer. It starts up again, but this time using the information that you've given it. OK, the PC is up and running again. Now it wants you to make a recovery diskette. You're supplied with an orange diskette like this for this purpose. 
the computer copies special information about itself onto the diskette. You'll only use the recovery diskette if you have problems with your PC, and without it, the technical support team will only be able to offer limited help. The recovery disk, along with the special reload CD supplied with every PC, can help you fix a whole range of problems and may save you the trouble and expense of having to return your PC. So, it's very important that you make the disk. You can find details of how and when to use the recovery disk in the user manual. And when you've made the disk, keep it somewhere safe and don't use it for anything else. When you've done that, the PC will want you to restart it again by pressing any key. OK, all that happens when you first switch on. But what about when you switch on in the future? Well, after a few seconds, it will give you a choice with this menu. Do you want to boot up into Windows, as you would normally want to, or do you want to boot up into DOS? DOS is a different operating software and gives you special memory configurations. You'd really only use it if you were playing some older games. As I said, normally you choose the Windows option, and if you don't choose either, the computer will automatically go into Windows after about 15 seconds. When the PC starts again, you're ready for the final step, registering your PC and signing up for your free Netline Internet account. You'll get your own email address and free access to the Internet. You must complete this procedure to register for your standard warranty and to ensure full support from our service staff. You'll be guided through a series of screens that ask a few simple questions. You'll need your time account number handy. It can be found on your invoice. Also, make sure your computer's connected to a phone socket before you start this procedure. The Getting Started leaflet and the user guide has more information on registration and internet sign-up. Once completed, you'll be able to surf the net and send and receive email. And that's it. Your PC is now set up and ready to use. But before you start really using your computer, there are a couple more safety procedures that you're advised to make. The first is to make another diskette, this time a Windows startup disk. If ever you have problems starting Windows, you can use this diskette to boot up from, and Windows will start using the settings on that. Now, this Windows disk is different from the recovery disk that we made earlier, and you should remember to make both. To make the diskette, take one floppy disk and put it in the disk drive. Click on the Start button, then click on Settings and Control Panel. Then double-click on Add or Remove Programs and select Startup Disk. Then click on the Create Disk button. The PC will write the necessary data onto the diskette. When it's done that, take it out, label it and keep it in a safe place. Well, that's the end of the special setup procedures for the first time that you switch on. So, when you start for the first time, you'll be asked for some information, including the product key. So, make sure you have the Windows 98 pack handy. You must make a recovery disk using the orange diskette and keep it in a safe place. Then, you sign up for your free internet account. Also, make a Windows disk and keep that safe too. Don't use those disks for anything else. Now, if you have some problems with the startup, here are some things to look at. First, check that all the cables are properly connected. And make sure that everything is plugged into the mains and that the mains power is on. If the PC makes a constant bleeping noise when you switch on, make sure there's nothing resting on the keyboard. If you get stuck at this screen, check that the mouse and keyboard cables aren't the wrong way round. If a message appears that says invalid or non-system disk, it means there was a floppy disk in the drive when you switched on. Take it out and press any key. If you can't see anything on the display, check that the monitor is plugged in and switched on. Check that the cable from the PC is connected correctly. Try adjusting the brightness and contrast controls. 
If just some of the screen is visible, you can adjust the display using special controls. You'll find all the instructions in the monitor's manual. In this section, we'll look at how to use software. When your PC has booted up and the Windows program has started, you'll end up with a screen like this. There's a patterned background with some small icons down the left-hand side. This whole area of the screen is called the desktop. It's where you'll do your work. These icons represent programs or folders containing groups of programs. And if you double-click on them, you launch those programs. But there are a couple of special ones to look out for. If you double-click on My Computer, you get this. These icons represent all the parts of your computer. Remember that the hard disk drive is called C. If you double-click on the C drive, you'll see these rows of folders. Folders are just that. If you imagine your hard disk drive as a big filing cabinet, these folders group individual files together. You can see here a folder called My Documents. Double-click on that and you can see all the documents that have been created. Now this is the recycle bin. When you want to erase or delete a file, you can simply drag that file over the bin and it'll be deleted. If you double-click on the recycle bin, you can see what you put in there, and if you decide you need it again, you simply drag it back. To get rid of files for good, you must empty the recycle bin, and we'll show you how to do this later in the program. That's the desktop. There's also this bar along the bottom, which is called the taskbar. You can see here on the right, there's a clock. Moving across, there are these buttons. These are called quick launch buttons. You click these once to launch certain programs. This one, for example, launches Internet Explorer, which you use to view pages on the Internet. And finally, here on the left is a button which says Start. Now, this really is your starting point for opening programs so that you can do your work. So, move the mouse pointer over the Start button and click. This menu pops up, and as you can see, there are a number of options. Now, say you want to draw a picture. First of all, you need to start the paint program, because this is the software that you'll use to draw the picture. So, take the mouse arrow onto the word Programs on the menu. You'll notice that some of the items have a black arrow beside them, and this means that there's a sub-menu underneath them. When the arrow is over the word Programs, the sub-menu pops up. Here you can see several icons, and these represent programs. Some of the programs are grouped together. You can tell this because this icon denotes a group, and beside the name of the group, there's another small arrow, which of course means that there's a submenu. You need to select the accessories group. The submenu appears, showing the individual programs. Then click on Paint to launch the Paint program. As you can see, the paint program appears on the desktop, already with a blank window for you to start drawing your picture. You've probably noticed that the programs appear in boxes on the desktop. These are called windows, and are what windows is all about. By putting your mouse pointer over the colored bar at the top of the window, holding down the left mouse button, and then moving the mouse, you can drag the window around the desktop. If you place the pointer over the corner of the window, it changes to this double-headed arrow. Again, hold down the left mouse button and move the mouse, and the size of the window changes. If you look in the top right corner of the window, you can see these symbols. The cross on the right closes the program. This one is called the Maximize button, and makes the window fill the desktop. When this happens, it changes to these two windows, and when you press that button, it goes back to its original size. This one is the Minimize button. Click on it, and the window disappears. But what you get is a button on the taskbar at the bottom, which represents that program. Click on that, and the program comes back. 
Now, why is this so important? Well, it becomes really useful when you're using more than one program because with Windows you can run several programs at the same time. This is called multitasking. You've got the Paint program running. Now, let's say you want to open another, a word processor perhaps. You do this in exactly the same way. From the Start menu, choose Programs, Lotus Smart Suite, and from this group of programs, choose Word Pro, which is a word processor. When Word Pro opens, click Create a Plain Document to work on. Now you can resize the window so that you can see both the Paint program and Word Pro, and Word Pro appears in front of Paint. The bar at the top of Word Pro is colored. That means that this is the active program. If you want to work in the Paint program, you just click in a bit of the Paint window that's showing. It jumps to the front and it becomes the active program. By resizing the windows, you can see both of them at the same time. You'll notice that you now have two buttons on the taskbar, one for Paint and one for Word Pro. By clicking on each of these, you can also select the one that you want. Now, everything we said about the windows that the programs appear in also applies to the windows that work appears in within programs. So here, there are two documents open in Word Pro and you can move between them in the same way. You'll notice on the Start menu there's the word Help. Well, one of the great things about PCs is that you're never very far away from Help when you need it. If you click on Help, you'll see this dialog box, which lets you select Help topics under Chapters, or an index, or you can even type in the word that you want help about, and it will come up with detailed explanations telling you what you need to do. Selecting help from this menu gives you help on working Windows software, but most programs come with their own help section as well. You can access this by clicking on the help menu at the top of the screen, or by pressing the F1 key at the top of the keyboard. For a good place to learn the basics, use Time's own Windows tutorial, Tutor Pro. You can start it by double-clicking the Time Computer's Support System icon on the desktop. You'll see a whole range of topics that will help you to learn the terminology, demonstrate the main features of Windows, and show you how to do many of the most common Windows tasks. You can find out how to navigate your way around the files and folders on your disk drives, make backup copies of your data files, create shortcuts to programs, and even change the appearance of your Windows desktop. If you're new to computers, Tutor Pro is a great way to start learning. Now, what if you buy some new software and want to use it on your PC? Well, you have to go through an installation procedure. Most programs these days come on CD, but you still get some smaller programs on one or more floppy disks. So, if you've got some new software on CD, this is what you do. Put it in the CD drive. Now, as we mentioned earlier, some CDs will start automatically. Now all you need to do is follow the instructions as they appear, clicking on Next or OK to move on to each screen. But what if the CD doesn't autoplay? Well, you can still install the software by going to Start, clicking on Run, and typing in the instructions that came with the CD. In this case, you need to type D colon backslash setup.exe. Click on OK and the PC starts copying the necessary files from the CD to the hard drive. For some programs, this can take quite a long time, so you have to be patient. The computer will tell you when it's finished. When you've finished using the PC, it is very important that you close it down correctly. What you must never do is just press the off switch. That could easily damage the software, and it would mean you could lose some of your work files. What you should do is go back to the Start menu. You've probably noticed the Shutdown option at the bottom. Select that and choose Shutdown from the options and click on OK. If you have any programs still open and you haven't saved the files you were working on, you'll be prompted to save them now. When you've done that, the PC will close down 
and switch off automatically. If for some reason you do switch off the PC without going through that procedure, the next time you switch on, Windows will run a program called ScanDisk. This will examine the hard disk drive to see if there's any damage or loss of data. Well, now that your PC is up and running, we're going to take a look at the other pieces of hardware that are connected to it. We'll look at the modem, which connects it to the telephone line, the video camera, PC TV, the printer, and other optional equipment. Now, all of these things are called peripherals. They all have to be able to communicate with the main bits of the PC, and for them to do this, they have to be set up correctly. So this section will guide you through some of the standard peripherals supplied with time systems. Many of these are ready to use as soon as you plug them into the PC. If you have other peripherals, you should follow the instructions that are supplied with them. Many peripherals, such as scanners and game pads, use these sockets called USB ports on the back of the PC. You can plug and unplug items into and out of USB ports while the PC is switched on. Most game pads supplied with time PCs can be plugged into the USB port and will be ready to use straight away. We recommend that you use port 2. Joysticks connect to this special port on the rear connector panel and are also normally ready to use immediately. Some time game pads and joysticks will be supplied with separate instructions and you should use these to set them up. If your gamepad or joystick wasn't supplied by time, you should follow the instructions that were supplied with them. If your system was supplied with the optional headset, you'll notice that this has two plugs. Connect the plug marked with a microphone symbol to the connector panel's mic socket and the one marked with a speaker or headphone symbol to the speaker socket. If this is already occupied by the cable from the speakers, you can connect it to the phone's socket on the front of one of the speakers. Some speakers also have an additional mic socket on the rear, which you can use instead of that on the back of the computer. Now let's look at the modem. The modem converts computer data into a form that can be transmitted over telephone lines. Most time PCs come with modems already installed, and all you can see of them is this row of sockets on the back of the system unit. It should have a cable attached which goes from the line socket on the modem to the telephone point. Now, there are several things that modems allow you to do. You can send and receive faxes, access the internet and use email, and use the video camera. So let's look at all of these in turn. First of all, faxing. You can use your PC to send and receive faxes. It can communicate with any other type of fax machine. It doesn't have to be another computer. To send a fax, double-click on the inbox to start Windows messaging. The first time you do this, you need to provide information about yourself and your PC setup. Choose Tools and Services. Highlight Microsoft Fax and click on Properties, then the User tab. Fill in all the appropriate details and then click on the Modem tab and Properties. Check the information on how the PC is to answer incoming fax calls and change it if necessary. Keep clicking OK until you're back to the inbox. You won't need to do this again unless you wish to change any of the settings. To send a fax, click on Compose followed by New Fax and follow the on-screen instructions. To receive a fax, you need to have Inbox open. Whether the phone is answered by PC automatically depends on the choices you made in the initial setup. With auto answer, the procedure is automatic. Most systems are supplied with a voice modem. Now this means that your PC can handle speech as well, so it can act as a telephone answering machine. Well, that's how you send faxes using the special faxing program. But you can also send faxes of documents directly from the program that created them. And you do this by sending the document to the fax program instead of to the printer. Let's say you've written this letter and want to fax it to someone. Normally, if you pressed the print icon, this letter would be printed out on the printer. 
But if you go to the file menu and select print, you can see that the printer is highlighted. However, you can change that to Microsoft Fax. Now when you click on print, you're taken through a series of dialog boxes asking you where you want to send the fax to, and off it goes. So much for faxing. We said that you can also use your modem to connect to the internet. You need two main pieces of software. First, a web browser. This allows you to access websites, the millions of interlinked pages that compose the graphical and multimedia content of the internet. Sites range from those of multinational corporations to the home pages of individuals. Some sites will have special areas where you can download files. Second, you need email software. This is similar to a word processing application and allows you to create and send emails to all corners of the world. You'll have been given your own email address when you signed up with Netline and email sent to this will be stored on the Netline computer until you make a connection and download the emails to your own PC. Windows comes preloaded with these applications, ready to use as soon as you've completed the Netline sign-up. To connect to the Internet, just double-click the Internet Explorer icon on the desktop. This box shows your username and your password, covered by asterisks for security. Now, just click on Connect and wait for a few seconds while your modem makes a connection with Netline. Once you're connected, use your browser to navigate the web by typing in the URL, that's the address, of the website that you're interested in. URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. It's the unique name by which a site can be identified. Most URLs start with www. followed by the site name. Hyperlinks like this on a page are used to move you to another page, or even another site, by a single click of the mouse. The mouse pointer changes to a hand when it touches a hyperlink and the link itself usually changes color if you've already visited it. The software remembers the pages that you've visited and using the forward and back arrows on the browser you can quickly return to previously visited sites. You can save your favorite URLs so that you don't need to remember their names next time you want to visit. If you're not sure where the information you want to find will be, use the search button on the browser. When you join up with Netline, they'll let you have access to a global search facility, which allows you to type in certain key words that may help define what you're looking for. For example, hotels and Key Largo. The search program will then sift through literally millions of websites for those key words and will present you with a list of matching sites. And all this takes only a few seconds. Every time you connect to Netline, the first page you see is their home page. If you're new to the net, this page has lots of useful information on how to create your own personal email address and how to get the best out of the internet. OK, that's the modem. But what if you have problems? The answer may be one of these. Make sure that the problem isn't at the other end. Is the person or service you're trying to communicate with ready and able to receive your call? Is the modem cable plugged properly into the back of the PC and into the telephone socket? Try to avoid very long lengths of cable. These can cause problems. You mustn't have too many phones on your line. Try disconnecting some. If you still have problems, try the Windows 98 modem troubleshooter under the Help menu. If you can't send a fax, make sure that Inbox is set up and running. If you can't receive a fax, check Inbox as well, and make sure that the Answer After So Many Rings box is activated. Now, let's have a look at the video camera. This optional package uses a small camera, like this, which plugs into the USB port. Oh, you'll also need a headset and microphone as well. Now you can use the camera to take still photos and moving images too. Even without the video camera, you can still receive video calls. To get the camera ready for use, install the special software supplied on CD by following the on-screen instructions. 
The PCTV system, if it's fitted, is completely separate from the video camera. It lets you watch television and view teletext from your desktop. You can also capture images from television or from a video recorder. PCTV works via a small card inside the PC. You can see the back of it here. It has a standard RF socket which you can use to plug in a television aerial. The channels available in your area will be given numbers but you can rename them with more meaningful names like BBC One and Channel Four if you prefer. Once tuned in, you can move between channels by using the channel buttons on the TV software menu bar or using the function keys on the keyboard. The quality of the picture will depend on the standard of television reception in your area. Oh, and remember, you will need a television license if you don't already have one. This is a digital camera. It takes still pictures and stores them on a computer memory rather than film like a normal camera. With a digital camera like this, you'll get a cable and some software. This will let you download the pictures from the camera to your PC so you can email them or print them out. The cable for the camera plugs into the COM port or the USB port on the back of the PC. Another optional peripheral is this scanner, which also connects to a USB port. We recommend you use USB port 1 for the scanner and port 2 for any other USB peripherals you may have. The scanner software may be preloaded so that you can start to use it straight away. Otherwise, there'll be instructions and a CD showing you how to connect it to the PC and install the software. Now, finally, in this part of the program, we'll look at printers. Now, the printer's job is quite simple. It produces a paper output of any work that you've created on the PC, whether that's a letter, a chart, or a picture. You need to connect it to the printer port on your PC. That's this one here. All printers should be supplied with their own software and instructions, which you should follow to get them connected and installed. You'll need a printer cable, too, if you didn't order one with your PC system. As an example, let's see how you'd install this Epson printer. It comes with a CD containing all the necessary software. Start with both the PC and the printer switched off. Carefully unpack the printer, making sure that you removed all the packing material. Then connect the printer cable and plug the printer into the mains, but don't switch on yet. Switch on the PC, insert the CD in the drive, and the disc will auto-play, presenting you with a menu from which you choose Install. Select the printer model from the list displayed and click on OK. This printer comes with its own help software too, and you should install this on your computer by clicking on OK, then on Next, as you move through the screens to complete the installation. If prompted, restart the PC and switch the printer on. If you have problems printing, check the obvious. Is the printer plugged in and switched on? Is the printer cable connected correctly? Is the printer online? Is there an ink or toner cartridge in the printer and is there some paper loaded? Read through the printer manual if you're unsure how to do this. If all that's okay, try a self-test on the printer. It will tell you how to do this in the printer manual. If this is okay, check that the printer is the default printer for your system and that it's selected. This tick shows that a printer is the default. Finally, try the Windows 98 printer troubleshooter under the Help menu. To keep your PC running at its optimum performance, it's worthwhile performing some routine maintenance. Hey, but don't worry, we're not asking you to get your screwdriver out. As you use your PC, you're constantly storing files on your hard drive, reading them, deleting them, and then adding more files and so on. Over time, the hard disk drive can become fragmented, with information not stored in the best way for reading and writing it quickly. So, there are a number of programs which check and tidy up your hard disk to keep it working efficiently. You should run these every month or so to keep your PC at its best.
you'll find these programs in the Accessories program group under System Tools. The first is ScanDisk. This checks to see that data is stored correctly on your hard disk. If it finds a problem, it can normally carry out a repair and everything will be okay. Just follow the instructions that it gives you. You'll most commonly come across ScanDisk if the machine is switched off without being shut down properly. The program then runs automatically next time you switch on to make sure everything's okay. Next is Disk Defragmenter. When files are written onto your hard disk, they're not always written in one long piece. The PC likes to fill up gaps on the hard drive, and so files may be split up into smaller pieces. These are written onto the hard drive to fill up the gaps left by deleted files. When the hard drive is new, things are neat and tidy, but over time, files become scattered, and this increases the time needed to read them. The Disk Defragmenter program reads all the files on your hard disk and reorganizes them into continuous pieces. This process can take over an hour, but it's worth doing every couple of months. Disk Cleanup is rather different. This program looks for files on your hard disk that are no longer needed. These won't affect your work files, but other types of file that the PC creates in order to work, but then sometimes doesn't delete. Then, there's the Recycle Bin, which we saw earlier. If you double-click on the bin, you can see a whole number of files here that have been deleted. If you did want to get one back, you would highlight it, and then go to the File menu and select Restore. This puts the file back in the folder where it originally was. But as you can see, you can very quickly end up with a lot of files in the Recycle Bin and they're taking up space and slowing down the hard disk. So, to empty the bin, again go to the File menu and select Empty Recycle Bin. Now they've all gone, and you can't get them back. The last piece of software you should run regularly is antivirus. Now, you may have heard of so-called computer viruses. These are hidden programs that can arrive on your PC without you knowing normally via a floppy disk or over the internet. Now, viruses affect PCs in different ways. Some cause messages to appear on the screen. Others can cause serious damage to your system. They're written by computer programmers, sometimes just as a joke, but sometimes with more malicious intention. Antivirus is a program that will detect whether there are any viruses on your system and then remove them. As we said, the most common sources of viruses are the internet and floppy disks which have been swapped between lots of machines. So, be careful about the floppy disks that you allow into your PC. Floppy disks and CD-ROMs from reputable companies will usually have been checked for viruses. But, if you've used any that you're not sure about, it would be worth running antivirus to keep your system clean. In this program, we've given you the help that you need to get started with your PC. Now, it may help you to watch parts of the program again in the future to refresh your memory. And don't forget the user guide, which gives more detailed information about the topics that we've covered. If you do have more serious problems, time is here to help. Depending on the nature of the problem, there are a number of telephone support lines for you to call. If you bought one of the Time Cover Extended Warranties, there are priority helplines. The numbers for these will be printed on your invoice. If you have a problem in the first 30 days after you've received your PC, you should call this special number. You will need to have your invoice handy, as you'll be asked to enter the first three digits of the invoice number when you make the call. The first 30 days support line is for hardware and software inquiries relating to the setting up of your system. After your first 30 days, or for delivery and invoice inquiries, there are other numbers to call, again depending on the type of inquiry. The Customer Services Department can help you with delivery queries and other non-technical issues. The setup and configuration line is available to help customers set up and use equipment once your PC is more than 30 days old. If you need help or advice on the software that was supplied with the computer, call the Software Assistance Service.
They can also give general advice on other software not supplied by Time. And finally, there's a dedicated Netline help desk, which can give help and advice on Netline and also answer more general queries about email and the internet. Subscribing to Netline also gives you access to Time Support, a website for Time customers where you can find technical help and advice, download the latest drivers and electronic manuals, or email your query through to our support staff. Now, when you call the helpline, it is useful if you can be near your PC and have it switched on. The operators may ask you to carry out some procedures as they talk to you, or they may ask you to try something and then call back when you've done it. If the support staff advise you to return the system to head office service center, you'll be given an authorization number called an RMA number. When your PC was delivered, you will have received a computer system return form and a number of important notice labels. Now fill these in and remember to put on the RMA number. Without that, the machine will not be accepted. Pack the machine up in the original boxes and put one of the labels onto each box. Depending on the nature of the problem, you may not need to return the whole system, perhaps only the main unit. The support staff will let you know. Depending on the type of work being carried out, data may be erased from your hard disk. So, it is important to back up any of your work files onto floppy disk before you return the PC. The system should be returned to head office by courier. Who pays for this depends on the reason for the return. The various types of return are listed in the user manual with other details. Well, that's about it. We hope that we've helped you to get started with your new PC. And remember, if you do have any problems, there's the online help on the PC itself. The user manual and tutorials for individual pieces of software offer a lot of very helpful information. And if you're really stuck, then there are the helplines, which can offer personal help over the phone. We want you to get the most out of your new PC. By taking time to get to know your machine a little better, you should have many years of enjoyment. Thanks for watching.